come from? Gentlemen, do you realize what we've found? It came from outer space to fill the world with terror. What earthly power can stop this terror? That's the signpost up ahead. Your next stop. The blood guns. And from outer space. Hey guys, it's another smooth one from the podcast from outer space. It's your boy Rob Scott. We got Adam Narlock in the house. Hey guys, thanks for listening. And as always, it's Ryan Scott. Hello everybody. And uh, without further ado, we got a special in-studio guest today, all the way from the East Coast. It's our boy Bobby Bones, aka The Boner, aka (laughs) Ryan, take it away. Yes, the ultimate uh, Trekkie. Or do you prefer Trekker or Niner? I'm probably just going to go with Trekkie. It uh, includes all of them, I guess. Okay, so not derogatory. That. I'm sorry, did I just catch a Niner in there? Ultimate Trekkie, you that's right. from a walkie-talkie? <laughs> I'm talking about <laughs> Star Trek today. Now, Bobby, how are we doing? How are we enjoying uh, the vacation? Uh, it's going pretty good. Y'all have been great to me, uh, letting me uh, stay on the couch. I've been doing a little traveling around, going up to some parks. A little trekking. Little, a little trekking, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm <laughs> trekking all over the place in Cali. Um, so, yeah, it's been great. And getting to see some of these guys here that I haven't seen in probably years and years. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah, let's talk about the last time we saw Bobby Bones. What are some of your favorite Bobby Bones <laughs> memories? Well, I remember him always coming over, throwing on Star Trek. Um <laughs> Always making me watch it. Huge Trekkie. <laughs> Throwing up the fucking hand signal. Left and right. Out the car like gang signs. He drops it like it's Spock. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. I mean, honestly, best time is the beach house. I'm Bobby Bones, and I brought all the beer. That's my favorite memory. I, yeah, our listeners aren't going to know what that is. Yeah, he asked a question. I'm just answering it. And I, I like partying answer. at the fucking beach house with Bobby. I feel like the beach house was like the ultimate, like, because that was everyone was there. Yeah. So, I mean, that's got to be the now, ultimate. Now, was that the last time you saw him? I think so. I mean, no God, that was a long time, man. God only knows. It was, um. What are we going into the Beach Boys now? Was that the one where you were like, she'll never know? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> As always, Adam was constantly having troubles with girls. And he still is. And he still is to this day. Plural. How girls. many you got going on now? Five, six? Uh, we're going to cut one. Wow, go you're going to air his dirty yeah. laundry? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to make it sound better for him, honestly. So Adam, the Bumble Trekker, is out here <laughs> banging like four girls at once, and he's coming in here this morning complaining. Now, all right, without further ado, let's get into this stuff, guys. All right. So uh, we covered Star Wars. Now it's time for us to cover longtime rival, the precursor, one of the biggest players in sci-fi lore, Star Trek. Uh, so in this episode, we're getting into the creation of Star Trek, the rise of the Trekkies, and of course, the life and times of the mastermind, Gene Roddenberry. Now, right off the bat, this episode's probably going to get a little heated. Um, Very controversial. Because we've got you know two guys over here, they watched fanboys maybe a little too much, <laughs> and they have got really caught up in the Star Trek, Star Wars rivalry. This is Bloods and Crips over here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we're going to start off with it, but uh, got Rob over here. He's obviously not a Star Trek fan. Big on Star Wars. Adamant Star Trek hater, I'd say. Whoa, come on. <laughs> Whoa, okay, now you're backing no, out? Hey, so I'm not backing out. <laughs> so are you more Call like... out. Are you more pro Star Wars or anti Star Trek? <laughs> I would say pro Star Wars. Okay. I don't hate Star Trek. I just think that Star Wars is better. It's not your cup of tea then. You could say that. I mean, honestly, didn't hate the movie that came out a couple of years ago. Chris Pine? Chris yeah. Pike? I only saw the What's first one. The gentleman's one, name? Pine or Pine? Pine. It's Pine okay. Yeah. The gentleman. <laughs> oh, Pine. Now, okay, so getting right into that, I mean, what are your some of y'all's first memories, first exposures to Star Trek? Here's how it started, like a lot of these things for me. <clears throat> We're mom, talking about Star Trek, not girls now. I don't know. 
<laughs> my mom worked at a toy store when I was a little kid. Uh, yeah, we've all heard this yep, tale. Yep, yep, you can listen to every episode. Here it is. <laughs> That's how it all started. Yeah. And our listeners forgot. <laughs> just want to remind you guys. Star Trek toys are on sale because no they, one likes it. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe, I don't know. I just remember my mom came home. I had like the Captain... I think it was Picard. I don't know. I'm probably mixing up the bald guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was uh, Patrick Stewart, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she brought home a couple action figures, <laughs> and then I remember seeing the next. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> blow up action figures, and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> he quoted it. Okay, I'm. I can't even get into that. All right, Your action mom figures. You blow action, up action figures. <laughs> action figures. Okay. Figures. All right. Continue. Plastic. Like these ones we have hanging on the wall of Lando Calrissian? Yes, and Admiral Akbar, Star and Wars. What movie is that from? Okay, get back to the story. <laughs> Come on. All right, so I just remember my mom bringing home the toys, and then I remember seeing The Next Generation on the TV. Okay, okay. This, this was like when I was four. TNG action, okay. Yeah. Amazing, you still remember that. Rob, what about you? <laughs> Uh, I think I was trying to watch cartoons on Saturday morning and dad was like, hey, you should check this out instead. So that's probably why I hate it. Yes. <laughs> now, okay, I was actually going to get into this because I had that as mine. So when I think of Star Trek, I th- obviously think of The Next Generation because that was on reruns, you know, yep. every morning. Dad, huge Trekkie. Uh, he had the Christmas ornament. I would push it over and over every year when I was a kid. It's no did. secret. Now... Spock also, here. happy holidays, live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, also, same reason. I wanted to watch, you know, my cartoons. Um, I wanted to watch Looney Tunes, you know. I wanted to watch Wiley e. Coyote, Tom and Jerry. Every Saturday morning, I would some saun- recess, maybe. I would saunter Ooh. down to the TV, and Dad was there watching the Next Generation and fucking. What are those woodworking shows? Yeah, this old house. Fuck Bob that Bula. show too. Yeah, I my, every morning I would go down and he was watching that and my gut would just sink because <laughs> I knew I had to sit through that bullshit until I could watch my cartoons. And so that probably plays a little bit, but you know, I was interested in Star Trek and nope, I will say me. that um the original series that's up there. Great sci-fi, I'd say. Mm. So uh, pretty much like y'all, well, in some ways, they uh, Next Generation was on, uh, what do you call it? It was on repeats and everything. So I'd just check out those at the time. Maybe I was like super young. I just wanted to see like lasers and shit. <laughs> yeah, uh, understandable. Space battles. Yeah. But, um, you know, as I got older, got a more appreciation of it and uh got into some of the other ones you know like deep space nine and voyager were on mm. when i was a kid so i yeah i was actually able to catch the new ones for that and uh you know i don't know just as i got older my appreciation of it on like the like philosophical level or whatever finally got that liberal arts degree <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> 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 scarily accurate <laughs> so yeah okay all right i mean hopping right into it actually i got a question for rob but before i forget this <laughs> yes 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 so you actually saw the uh of the new movies that came out you actually saw the first uh star trek like yes. that reboot uh what made you want to see that since you had such like an anti-star trek <laughs> disdain. disdain i'm pretty sure that we were back home and I think that we went to see it with my dad, if I'm not mistaken. I, I remember seeing it. I'm dad. pretty sure me and Ryan took my dad yeah, to go see it because he, he's, he's a big Trek fan. Guy. So I was like, all right, I'll bite the bullet on this one and go see this bullshit. And then he said, hey, uh, hey, it's pretty not goddamn good film. <laughs> 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 now, uh, okay, so uh, sources for this one. Now, I, will, I do want to thank um, our guest right up front. This guy actually did a lot of research on this one, kind of put together this whole outline. Now, the sources, we got to cite our Memory Alpha, which is basically the official Star Trek Wikipedia, um, Chaos on the Bridge documentary, and a History Channel documentary. So without further ado, let's get into the life and times of the man himself. Now, the year is 1921. <sighs> yeah. You hear that? World War I has just ended. Uh, prohibition's in full swing. Nobody can drink. Um, jazz, <laughs> you know, jazz is popping off. Women, they can now vote. Mm. You could say things are 
Roaring. It's the 20s. <laughs> <laughs> now, August 19th, Eugene Wesley Roddenberry was born in El Paso, Texas. And he was the first child of Eugene and Carolyn Roddenberry. And in 1923, the fam moved to L.A. upon Gene's father passing the civil service test and given a police commission. So this guy's in the LAPD. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck the police. (laughs) Now, during his childhood, uh, Roddenberry was obviously interested in reading, and he was an avid fan of pulp magazines. Uh, Stories such as John Carter of Mars... Tarzan, and the Skylark series by E.E. E. Smith. Now, that's funny because you were also a big fan of Palm magazines. Of what? Palm magazines. Palm? Yeah. Oh, I got it. I was a big fan of Tit magazine. <laughs> 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 Okay, so now... Had a little shrine to dedicated to it in his closet. Now, Roddenberry's father, uh, this guy kept rabbits. And the oh, that's cho- weird. <laughs> the, uh, now the children they would sell them outside the house uh so he's raking in this black market rabbit money all right kids time to go out on the fucking street and sell <laughs> these rabbits today he's got his kids selling these fucking rabbits he's got his kids pushing the these yeah, rabbits, rabbits. <laughs> where do you think those easter bunnies come from man i mean hey it's the 20s man uh, de- depression wasn't that around this time yeah. yeah. 30s, yeah. 30s, I wonder how much they were oh, selling okay. those little guys for. <laughs> Who knows? But he was killing it with these rabbits. Imagine going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> you thought it was a lemonade stand. You pull up and they're selling <laughs> fucking rabbits. And you got to think. rabbits. This guy's a cop, so who's going to fucking tell him off? <laughs> Just one more reason why the LAPD is so corrupt. Started way back with Gene Roddenberry's. Oh, I'm sure it started before that. <laughs> yeah, probably. Now... These rabbits would go on to become the subject of Roddenberry's first published work in his school's twice yearly newspaper known as The Ace. (laughs) I'm assuming that's similar to Stephen King's, you know, early uh, Mr. Rabbit trick novels, you know. Just classic kids making well, stories about bunnies. Coincident with the rabbits. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Starting to see a trend here. Rabbits were big. Now, um, Gene attended... Los Angeles City College in 1939, and he majored in the police science curriculum. Uh, and he was also president of the school's police club. Oh, so he's an arc. So, I mean, this guy, <laughs> this guy is a stiff right from the jump. Uh, and although Roddenberry's family uh, was churchgoers, he became an atheist when he was a teenager. Damn rabbit selling probably scarred him. Also, that's classic teenager behavior. So. Maybe not at the time, huh? but you know, everyone's like, man, fuck that God. I'm just thinking that it's such a thing that the type of guy who would be into Star Trek and create Star Trek was also president of his school's police club. What do you mean? Like he's that big of a nerd? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty much. Huh? <laughs> okay. okay. This I find interesting. Uh, he didn't believe the, like, why he became an atheist, I guess. He didn't believe the claims of many preachers and found from experience that many people who were working to improve the world were atheists. Mm. So, you know, he's at L.A. City College. Um, he's probably not partying, you know, police club. He's probably, like, going to parties and with, like, people. a billy club. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, so he's at college, comes interested in aeronautical engineering, and obtained a pilot's license through the United States Army Air Corps uh, sponsored civilian pilot training program. Say that five times fast. Yeah. So this was a uh, civilian program sponsored by the Army where people could fly. Now, what? where the fuck is this now? Sign me up. I want to just learn to fly planes. They probably don't want people doing that anymore, buddy. This <laughs> well, is the 20s we're talking about. We'll find out. Didn't play out too well for old Gene here. Probably trying to fly in some rabbits. <laughs> no, no. He's, he's off this rabbit smuggling business for good. <laughs> and now, around this time, um, what happens, guys? Pearl Harbor. Mm. December 7th, 1941. A day which will live in infamy. So Gene enlists in the Army Air Corps on December 18th, 1941. 
and was commissioned as a second lieutenant on August 5th, 1942. Now, he was stationed at Bellows Field, Oahu. Beautiful beach there, by the way. Oh, yeah. And he would join the 394th Bomb Squadron 5th Bombardierment Group of the 13th Air Force, which flew the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress. Badass plane. Mm -hmm. In 1943, while flying the B-17 Yankee Doodle, the plane Roddenberry was piloting overshot the runway by 500 feet and impacted trees, crushing the nose, starting a fire, and killing two men. Not a pilot, Gene was, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're also getting like shot at by like Japanese. No, no, man. this was what, coming off the runway? This was uh, landing on it. He overshot the runway. Well, whatever program he was in. That civilian program. Trump University. Maybe the plane was just committing suicide after someone named it Yankee Doodle. Cut that. <laughs> <laughs> now this is for you, T-Bag. You're an official report guy. Yes, yes. And what do we know? <laughs> official reports, they're always suspect. Oh. Mm-hmm. That while the official report absolved Roddenberry of any responsibility... There were those in the squadron who blamed him for the men's deaths. Now, that right there, I mean, got to take a toll on the young guy, you know? Mm. Uh, And Roddenberry would spend the remainder of his military career in the United States as a captain. So they promoted him after this. (laughs) I guess. Now, he was was flying all over the country as a plane crash investigator. He was flying or he was being flown? (laughs) Well, I guess he was being I'm guessing they probably were like, all right, buddy, you're not flying planes anymore after that one. Yeah, and my question is, um, was that by choice, or did they basically, is that the Army saying, fuck you, now you're going to investigate plane crashes? (laughs) Well, he probably... the dog's nose. (laughs) (laughs) He probably didn't want to uh, be in that squadron anymore. Those guys were fucking Well, they were blaming him, yeah. But, I mean, do you know, was that a choice, or did the Army put him there? No one knows, but... It's a question for Roddenberry. (laughs) That's a question for Gene himself. Now, uh, during this time... It's the last time you freaking fly on the Yankee Doodle, all right? You're investigating (laughs) this shit now. Yeah, well, that just doesn't make sense to me. They send a guy who crashed the plane to invest... Hey, no one's going to know about plane crashes more than this guy. (laughs) Let's send him to investigate. uh, First-hand experience. (laughs) Yeah, now... So after this... Gene was in another accident as a passenger this time on a military flight, crashed again and caught fire again. Man, this guy has a hell of a good luck charm. However, this time Roddenberry was able to pull three men to safety and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal. Funny story about that. Real funny. And what's that? You know, our very own Rob Stone crashes cars like it's his job no medals over here <laughs> they don't give you a medal well, for that no one died when i crashed a car so and i don't think he saved three men from the wreckage no he didn't that was only one time <laughs> <laughs> guys it's only happened three times please <laughs> okay so the war is coming to a close now uh it's 1945 and our pal gene he's now flying for pan am world airways little uh Catch me if you can, actually. Yep. Except he's not faking it. <laughs> or maybe he was. That's <laughs> why he's <laughs> crashing. <laughs> and, uh, now, upon his time here, he experienced his third crash. Oh, Ooh, just like me. While on the Clipper Eclipse. Try saying that five times. That five. sounds like a Star Trek thing already. Yep. Uh, June 18th, 1947, that is in the birthday. Syrian desert. Now, at this point, you really got to kind of say, hey. <laughs> maybe flying just isn't for me you know maybe i don't get in a plane again um not gene not gene he's he's this is his third crash and in this one he sustained two broken ribs but was still able to evacuate passengers from the burning plane with the other crew guys i've been in this situation before just follow me <laughs> totally not a big deal <laughs> he's the one that came up with like the emergency procedure standard yeah probably <laughs> Uh, you know, he repeatedly re-entered the plane to pull out more passengers. Uh, some were burning, and he beat them with pillows to put out the flames. So I just imagine, like, this point, he's full Rambo. <laughs> he's like, God, not again! God, <laughs> da, 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 da. 
<laughs> yeah, he's just fucking scarred and he's fucking he's trying to save as many people as he can he's got broken ribs but that doesn't matter adrenaline's coursing through his veins he took charge in the aftermath and formed two teams to search for civilization they're in the desert the team he led trekked no pun intended four miles across the desert to the town of Mayadin where he telephoned an emergency landing strip about 38 miles away. And in response, uh, the Syrian army dispatched planes with medical teams to the crash site. Roddenberry returned to the site to assist the survivors. Uh, In all, eight passengers were unharmed, 11 needed hospital treatment, and 14 people died in the crash. Oh, this one wasn't really his fault. (laughs) I mean, I guess... That's what Rob said after all of his activities, too. So. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. So, it's now 1948. Gene, his first child was born, April 4th. And at this point, his wife is very concerned. I would, too. I wouldn't let this man <laughs> <Yeah>. wear it. <laughs> she doesn't want to raise this kid alone. And she's like, Gene... You gotta stop crashing planes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so this guy, he says, hey, you're the fucking woman. You just got the right to vote not that long ago. Uh, I'm going to keep flying. He continued to fly for Pan Am. But on a particularly cold and snowy day while flying out of LaGuardia Airport, the controls of his plane froze during takeoff, almost causing the plane to stall. And it was this incident that marked the end of Gene's career as a pilot. This is what causes him to stall. <laughs> yeah. Oh, plane froze, can't take off. Not the crash where 14 <laughs> people died. Not the first one where you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the first one, you know, that's wartime. Right. So yeah. understandable, you know. Who knows, maybe the plane got shot, something with the controls caused him to overshoot the runway. We don't know. We weren't there. The like, second one, maybe. He wasn't even flying. So yeah, so maybe like he's it. like, hey, maybe I don't fly. I mean, I would kind of be like, hey. This is a little too dangerous for me. I mean, fool me once. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, while... Fool me again. Can't be fooled. I guess, you know, (laughs) now this time he's probably just thinking, okay, uh, my wife's right. Oh, he would never admit that. (laughs) Probably not. So Gene resigns from Pan Am on May 15th, 1948. Well, now you just got to wonder, is Pan Am just hiring anyone to fly these planes? Because you're looking at this guy's resume. He's already been in two crashes, and they're just like, hey... You want to come fly for us? Great. So you're signed up. Well, they let fucking Frank Abningale yep, yep. control the plane with literally no experience. He just got a fake pilot's uniform, and they said, hey, you look like a pilot. Get on this plane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, Pan Am, no longer around. Right, so there's a reason. It's also 1948, <laughs> and planes have only been in existence for like 40 years. So, I mean. So anyone, anyone can do it. I mean, it's only been 40 years since the Wright brothers, so think of how far they've gone and how, like, I mean, they've been around a while now. That's true, man. That's They're true. probably like anybody dumb enough to step in this. Go ahead yeah. and take the job. Go ahead. Good luck. Um, so he resigns, decided to pursue his dream of writing, in particular, for the brand new medium of the time, the television. So, while he was hoping for his big break... And as they say, hoping doesn't pay the bills. Uh, Gene joined the LAPD. In February of 1949, he spent his first 16 months in the traffic division before transferring to the newspaper unit, which eventually became the public information division. That sounds like a demotion. Those both sound terrible, honestly. Well, I mean, just joining the LAPD... (laughs) can't be that great especially back then i mean it's like flying's too dangerous so i'm gonna join the lapd <laughs> yeah. uh when racism what is that it's all time high well he's a white guy he's all right yeah but you know he's got fidget spinners to look forward to i think this will play into his career which we'll get into a little okay, later okay so so flying's not working out uh let me just do the next most dangerous thing i can do join the lapd <laughs> <laughs> so uh here um 
the public information division. Uh, this is where Gene became the chief of police's speech writer. Mm. Uh, and this is kind of where he starts to get his foot in the door with the entertainment biz. Uh, so the radio series and 1951 television series Dragnet. You guys familiar? Sounds like a real drag. <clears throat> it is. A bunch <laughs> of narcs. Uh, so they would get uh, many of their stories from the LAPD. So Roddenberry constantly gathered stories from his colleagues on the force, uh, and he wrote them up for submissions to the show. And he would split the $100 payment 50-50 if they sold. Now this extra income, not bad for the time, especially since he earned only 400 a month from the LAPD. Probably enough money to buy a house back then. (laughs) (laughs) So Gene went on to become a technical advisor for the new television version of Mr. District Attorney. There's Rob's new nickname. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with this, just play a little clip from the intro because I think something like this, like the only reason this is a thing is because it was the 50s. Mr. District Attorney. Champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the right and privileges of all its citizens. Now so, imagine that comic book. It is. Oh, it's God. like uh, it's essentially started off kind of like a comic, and it's a, it's a DA as a fucking hero. It's like uh, the original Harvey Dent. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of like uh, that Law and Order like show. Now they take all the uh, stuff from yeah the modern police. But I mean, this literally like um, if you look up the pictures of this here, this will be our just Google it. Check out the pictures of this. It's literally like. He's a fucking superhero. <laughs> this guy is district attorney. Um, so he was the technical advisor for Mr. District Attorney. And at this time, he also went on to write for the show under his pseudonym, Robert Wesley. Uh, he says that the pseudonym was used after a fortune cookie revealed a message saying, a change of name will bring you fame. Mm. So, you know, as they say... Fortune cookies, always right. Who says that? (laughs) Gene Roddenberry. (laughs) So he continues to sell scripts to different programs. Um, Found it was increasingly difficult to write and be a policeman. So June 7th, 1956, he resigns from the force to concentrate on writing. Uh, And side note, the chief actually revealed that he had been intentionally connecting Gene with television professionals for the past few years um, in hopes that someone would give him an offer. They didn't want to be responsible because he's a liability. Oh, crash, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I mean, you know, hell of a guy, that police chief. Maybe he's the one that wrote that fortune. Maybe. Mm. Okay. So Roddenberry was promoted to the head writer for the West Point story. Uh, He wrote 10 scripts for the first season and about a third, which is about a third of the episodes. Uh, He wrote scripts for a number of other series in his early years. And this is when he met and worked with many actors who would eventually star in his series, Star Trek. West Point story, is that like West Side story, but in the army? Um, I guess. I didn't really look into that one. Mm. Do you want me to Google it now? No, I'm good. <laughs> Food for thought for our listeners. Just another exciting piece of work that this guy worked on. Yeah, along with Mr. District Attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Star Trek is the pinnacle of his work. Now, this guy this seemed to be a working lot. on a lot. Uh, so another, like, one of the most notable shows he worked on was The Lieutenant. Whoa, what's that one about? <laughs> <laughs> so this one was produced with the cooperation of the Pentagon and allowed them to film at actual Marine bases. Uh, and during the production of the series, Roddenberry regularly would butt heads with the Department of Defense over potential plots. Uh, the department eventually withdrew its support after Roddenberry pressed ahead with a plot titled To Set It Right. 
in which a white and black man find a common cause in their role as Marines. Now, we got to say, this was like racism at its peak, just like Twilight Zone. You know, Rod Serling was trying to write um, progressive material, and he would constantly get pushed back from the networks. We're seeing the same thing here with Gene. The show was not renewed after its first season, but Roddenberry was already working on a new series idea, and this idea was Star Trek. Surprised they didn't call it Star Cops. Going with all the damn cop shows that he worked on. <laughs> this is the fifties, man. <laughs> <laughs> so in night, 19- so that TV in the fifties is just basically a bunch of cop shows. Just imagine LLC. space cops, and we've got <laughs> we've got these guys shooting around in a ship. They see like an alien, and they just all get out of the car and beat him, <laughs> like uh, fucking Rodney <laughs> King. Jesus Christ. Space racism. <laughs> <laughs> Let's we just take constant rip um, off cops. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we just rip off like LAPD scandals, but put it in space. That's a fucking great show. There we go. It's basically like Law and Order in space. Yeah, but oh. more racist. <laughs> <laughs> so the exact opposite of Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1964, oh man, I actually meant to do more shit because this work is kind of. <laughs> I was very confused by this. Maybe our Trekkie expert can help us out here. And so, I'm honestly asking. 64, it was rumored that Desilu, is that how you would say it? Uh, Desilu, they did uh, Lucy. I love Lucy. Okay, oh. Desilu. See, I'm already feeling better. Um, so they were interested in buying a new television series. They were a smaller company than MGM, but Roddenberry took his chances, which led to a three-year deal with Desilu, that was in April of 64. So then I guess that's the production company. And then he he has to then sell Star Trek to broadcasting networks, right? Is that how it work, worked back then? I am honestly not sure about that one. Um, I know Desi Lou was involved in uh, like Desi Arnaz, Louis, uh, Lucille Ball. They were all into that. But um, okay. I'm not exactly sure the like relationships business wise yeah because i think like desilu was the production company then he had to sell it to like the broadcasting network now he pitched it to several different networks uh referring to it as a quote-unquote wagon train to the stars but no luck uh he first pitched the idea to program executives at cbs they apparently quizzed him for two hours about his plans for the show and then told him hey get the fuck out of here (laughs) And they bought Lost in Space, the more family-oriented program. Now, in May of 64, NBC's vice president of programming, Mort Werner, (laughs) agreed to give Roddenberry the chance to write three story outlines, one of which NBC would select for a pilot. And initially, test audiences were not impressed. But five days before the first broadcast, Roddenberry appeared at the 24th World Science Fiction Convention and previewed where no man has gone before. And after the episode, he received a standing ovation, despite the initial TV ratings being very low. Yeah, because it's not a bunch of nerds that are in that (laughs) population that are watching the damn show. So keep in mind, with Star Trek, Gene wanted to tell more sophisticated stories using futuristic situations as a lens to view current problems on Earth. And he wanted to show how they could uh, be made right through humanism and optimism. Real optimistic guy. I mean, I guess you have to be optimistic after (laughs) being in four uh, plane accidents. And being part of the LAPD. Yeah. And this is also similar to uh, Twilight Zone. You know, Rod used the whole sci-fi horror aspect to view current problems. The series writers frequently address moral and social issues such as slavery, warfare, and discrimination. Uh, Previous sophisticated science fiction TV included anthology series such as, mentioned earlier, The Twilight Zone and the British Quarter Mass serials. But Star Trek was the first American sci-fi series with a continuing cast that was aimed at adults, telling modern Morality tales with complex narratives. Now that, right there, probably one reason that we hated it as kids. (laughs) (laughs) 
Now let's get into the diversity, progressiveness. Now this is what I was talking about. So obviously this guy's been in the LAPD, seen a lot of racism. Gene, not a racist guy, not a racist bone in his body, I'm thinking. I uh, think that. Because at the time... <laughs> at the time, you know, at the time, uh, there were few non-white or foreign roles in American TV dramas. Now, with Trek, Roddenberry wanted to create a multi-ethnic crew for the Enterprise, so he included uh, African American woman, Uhura, a Scotsman. Well, real diverse there. Montgomery Scott. Fuck you. An Asian. We all are an Asian, Hakaru Sulu, and most notably an alien, the half Vulcan Spock, which was just a white guy with pointy ears. <laughs> <laughs> Basically a fucking elf. <laughs> a space elf. They should have had a uh, left handed nerdy. redhead. And- hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't complain about that one, maybe. So uh, in the second season, reflecting the Cold War, Roddenberry added a Russian crew member. Mm. Sounds Pavel like a hockey player. Chekhov. Uh, now, this is where we get into the whole, what I would like to call um, Roddenberry. He was on the forefront of the hippie nerd movement. Mm, that's why I had him dressed in rainbow colors. Hey, all I'm saying is, hear me out. The show had a 60s counterculture mindset in imagining, because we got to remember, not like Star Wars. This isn't set in the past. This is set in the 23rd century world. Not uh, like Star Wars at all. Yep. So he's saying, you know, uh, humans had outgrown war and prejudice. So he's the ultimate nerd hippie. He's saying, mm-hmm. we are progressing so far that we've outgrown these petty things like racism and war. And Gene expressed the show's message as, We must learn to live together. Or most certainly, we will soon all die together. So Gene was a humanist, as were other sci-fi writers of the day, such as Terry Pratchett, Phil Pullman, Arthur C. Clarke, and Isaac Asimov. His basic beliefs, which heavily influenced his writing on Star Trek, were that human beings can solve problems through reason and cooperation. Uh, There's no need to turn to superstition or religion for help. Human understanding and intelligence will help us to develop and progress, and that the universe is a natural wonder waiting to be explored and understood. This philosophy, clearly evident in the many adventures and shenanigans that we see in Star Trek. You're talking about shenanigans, right? Hey, Farva, what's that restaurant you like with all the... (laughs) (laughs) It was Super Troopers. He did a super trooper. (laughs) (laughs) Star Trek's contributions to television history, one of the many, include giving women jobs of respect, most notably through casting uh, Nichelle Nichols, a black actress, as the ship's communication officer, credited with American television's first interracial kiss between a white man and an African-American woman. Now, that kiss was shared by Shatner and Nichols. And then they got it all. <laughs> Honestly, no, probably. <laughs> well, a guy he knows. Anybody uh, got the story on that? Here's my understanding is what happened was um, Gene really wanted this in there. Um, again, with the whole progressive humanist. Yep, he was values. horny as a devil. Well, this... That's not progressive. (laughs) So that actually comes in later. (laughs) But uh, what happened was he was all for it. Shatner was the one who heard about it, and he was the one... And then he really got into it. So they did like 20, 30 takes of that with them kissing. It was like, no, no, let's just keep doing that again. It didn't feel right. And that then, was Shatner, right? Yeah, like Shatner. Shatner was like, come on, let's do it again. Let's Pretty good yeah. to squints over so, there. He's got a uh, fucking giant boner. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's into some interracial <laughs> stuff, too. <laughs> but uh, eventually the studio execs came by, and they were like, okay, um, beyond the fact that you've kissed this woman for like two hours straight, <laughs> um, this probably isn't going to sell in the South, so we need you to do just you know a scene where 
the like stuff, without the kiss. Yeah, without the kissing, where stuff happens that's supposed to happen, but not with the kiss. So they did one take on that. That was the last take of the day. And uh, when they went back, Shatner had his eyes crossed the entire time during the scene and was basically like, well, I guess you guys got to use the kissing scene then. Yeah. So he pulled the old one-two Houdini on him, just like we talked about in our last, uh, or just like we talked about with Mary Shelley. Figured no one would believe him if they didn't actually see the footage. Now, black actresses at the time on television were always cast as servants. Mm. You know, it's no secret. Uh, In fact, Whoopi Goldberg recalled the first time that she saw Uhura, she excitedly told her mother, Mama, there's a black woman on television, and she ain't no maid. (laughs) (laughs) Now, in an interview with Nichols, um, the actress, uh, she said the day after she told Roddenberry that she planned to leave the show, she was at a fundraiser at the NAACP and was told, hey, big fan wants to meet you. His name is William Shatner. No. Oh. So <laughs> big fan, show with <laughs> big fan wants to meet her. And she's like, okay, bring on the fucking nerds. Let's see this, <laughs> let's see this fucking clown. And Nichols said in that interview, and we quote, I thought it was a Trekkie, so I said, sure. I looked across the room, and there's Dr. Martin Luther King walking towards me with a big grin on his face. He reached out to me and said, yes, Miss Nichols, I'm your greatest fan. He said Star Trek was the only show that he and his wife Coretta would allow their three little children to stay up and watch. When she told King about her plans to leave the series, I never got to tell him why, because he said, you can't. You're part of history. Now and he uh, said, one day I have a dream. That my children can enjoy Star Trek. She didn't tell him about how Captain Kirk was trying to kiss her for 20 hours straight. (laughs) (laughs) Well, she was probably into it. So when she told Roddenberry what King said, this brought him to tears. Now, as they say, uh, hindsight is 2020. So looking back, the series has actually received criticism for its portrayal of women. You can't please everybody. Particularly... Especially women. Well, now this... <laughs> oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> this is actually kind of... Uh, I want to get your guys' thoughts on this. Um, I think Rob just covered it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hear me out. Hear me out. Let's bring it back down to one. So particularly, uh, the women's crew uniforms. They consisted of many skirts high heel boots, and heavy makeup. Uh, they have been deemed as degrading to women for highlighting them as sexual objects. However, the uniform's usage of the miniskirt was considered progressive at the time as the miniskirt was a symbol of modern women's economic and sexual independence. So this really, this is what I thought of is like that old Dean Martin song. Play it. You know the one where? Why don't you just play it? Well, I don't. I don't want to get into oh, any on. issues with Dean. Come on. Okay. Well, he's dead. Play a little clip. I really can't but stay. baby, it's cold outside. Got to go but away. baby, it's cold outside. Now you know he's like it's very rapey. Baby, it's cold outside. He's like saying, hey, she's like, I want to go home, but he's like, oh, come on, you got to stay, you got to stay, and he basically rapes her. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Baby, so, it's cold outside. The Christmas song. Yeah, that's dude, a song that's, about rape. that's a song about rape, dude. It's definitely rape. And <laughs> now, now, and listen to this. Now, this is where I'm getting at. I'm using that song as a metaphor here because at the time it came out, that's just like this. So, looking back, many skirts, women are like, "Hey, where are you being used as sexual objects?" But back then, they were like, "I can wear this mini skirt." You know, it's showing my sexuality. I don't care. Burning and, bras. Well, that's different. But <laughs> this this song, yeah, he's saying stay, stay, stay. But she's like, we're, it was seen at the time as like progressive that she stayed with him because she didn't care what the neighbors would think. I think it's just like uh, you well, got like feminism back then and what the definition of like different, well, like lip, 
women's liberation, what that definition has meant to like each generation has evolved. Like back then, it might have been like, oh yeah, wear a mini skirt. Yeah, wear wear a mini skirt, be sexy because you're coming off the regressive fifties where everyone's just sitting in their house. Yep, uh, housewives. Now yeah. let Dean Martin slip something in your drink and make you stay yeah. in his house. This yeah. is a Christmas song. The, oh, listen to the song. <laughs> hey, we're gonna listen to it after. Yeah, this. it's gonna ruin your Christmas, buddy. Because <laughs> Christmas is a bullshit holiday, anyways. Think now, about how she felt, you know. Um, now here's what I'm thinking. Also, we all know feminism was set up by the male patriarchy to keep the women down, so it doesn't even really matter. Wow. I'm going to need a citation on that. (laughs) (laughs) Conspiracy theory over here. I mean, you know, they invented the miniskirt. They invented high heels. They invented makeup. Does this mean they invented yoga pants? Probably. Probably invented yoga. Shout out to that guy. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, getting off of that spiel. Getting off on that or getting off of that? Okay. Now, Gene corresponded frequently with legendary sci-fi writer Isaac Asimov as to how to address the issue of Spock's growing popularity and the possibility that his character would overshadow Kirk. Because, you know, he wants Kirk to be the main guy. He's like, this is my fucking ace in the hole, uh, but everyone's really biting Spock shit, you know? (laughs) They were like, hey, this fucking alien pointy-eared elf is fucking awesome. And Asimov suggested having Kirk and Spock work together as a team to get people to think of Kirk when they think of Spock. So this is just like X-Files, you know? Because, I mean, we've got, like, two different people making one well-rounded mind. Like yin and yang. Kirk and Spock. Mulder and and Skull. Mm. Mm. No, don't. Mm. You're (laughs) supposed to be on my side, asshole. I just think there could be a better one. Okay. Luke and Obi-Wan. It's got to be a yin and a yang. R2, D2, and and C3P. Obi-Wan and Anakin. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Thank you. He's the voice of reason. But they weren't, well, okay. Okay. If you're you're taking the prequels, you know. How about Vader and Obi-Wan? Ooh. We just went down a rabbit hole. This arm is the dark side. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, the series gained multiple Emmy Award nominations during its run, but never won. Hmm, Weird. Uh, despite a restricted budget, the series' special effects were superior to contemporary TV series. Its stories were often written by prominent sci-fi authors, and many of its production values, such as costume, set design, uh, were of high caliber for such a low budget. Now, during its network run from 66 to 69, the original series' ratings were mediocre at best. A letter writing campaign by fans, unprecedented in size, contributed to NBC's decision to renew the series for a third season. Again, so it's how, like 100? I mean, just like Twilight Zone, they got thousands of fan letters saying, hey, don't cancel this shit. So they didn't. Hmm. Um, okay. But okay. the network put the series in a disadvantaged time slot. Uh, For the third season, it was moved to 10 p.m. on Friday nights, and realizing the show could not survive in that time slot and burned out from arguments with the network, Roddenberry resigned from the day-to-day running of Star Trek, although he (laughs) he continued to be credited as executive producer, and NBC announced Star Trek's cancellation February 1969. Hell of a year. Now... Because of this whole, like, uh, the way, you know how we talked about the whole um, fuckery with, like, Desilu and then selling it to the network? Like, the whole way it was sold to NBC, it left production $4.7 million in debt. And the last episode of Star Trek aired just 47 days before Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon as part of the Apollo 11 mission. And Roddenberry declared that he would never write for television again. Oh, why is that? Now, do we got any more on that? Is that like he was mad? I'd imagine that, you know, how do you write about something that's like, you write about something that you think is going to be the near future. The final frontier. Yeah, and then all of a sudden it's actually happening like, you know, a month after your series goes off the air. So he was mad. He said... No, it's like, how do you write about something that actually is happening now? 
Oh, people write about it all the time. I just feel like, you know, it's like his wife cheated on him, left him for another guy. He's <laughs> never going to love again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to dance again. Now, okay. So, careless whispers. Now, see, I was thinking either he was mad, like he's like, yeah. fuck, man. It's not the final frontier anymore. We got Neil and Buzz out there fucking playing golf, balling it up on the moon. Space hype happens. Yeah. Have you seen and Buzz's then, girlfriend? Whoa. He's like, the, the hype is over. and um, Or he's like, oh my God, my dreams have been realized. We have reached the moon. I'm not going to write again. That's his dream, it's the moon? He's not stopping well, at the moon. He's a space general, guy. Yeah, he's a space guy. M A. They thought we'd be in Mars in like five Mars, years. Bitches. <laughs> yeah. Let's get into the rise of the Trekkies. So the first Star Trek convention was held at New York's Statler Hilton Hotel in January of 1972 and drew in 3,000 fans. Within two years, attendance at the annual get-together had quadrupled. Now around this time... Things were not well on the home front for old Gene. Gene was faced with a mortgage and an expensive divorce. Boom, I knew it. And alimony payments. Uh, He began to support himself by giving college lectures and appearances at sci-fi conventions. These presentations included screenings of The Cage, which was like the original, original pilot that didn't air. And it actually had a different actor as Kirk, who I think he's like cooler. Like he looks more badass. I forget the gentleman's name, but so, um, Pike. Yeah, Pike. Pike Pine. Dude. <laughs> so they also aired the blooper reels from the production of Star <laughs> Trek, and the conventions. These conventions began to build the fan support to bring back Star Trek. So TV Guide. Described Star Trek in 1972 as the show that won't die. Just like Gene, you know, four plane crashes couldn't get him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just like Michael Myers, you know, using yeah. the damn uh, William Shatner mask. You know, TV Guy guys like, die. this show just won't die. So he continued to sell other sci fi ideas to networks. Um, however, none were very successful. Now, NASA originally intended to name its first shuttlecraft the Constitution. However, after Trekkies launched a letter-writing campaign in 1976, they switched to the more popular choice, (laughs) Enterprise. Now, that right there is just the level of nerd (laughs) fans that that is. They're writing NASA to rename it Enterprise. Um, if you could just name it Enterprise, <laughs> um, Spock would really appreciate that. And they organized an entire campaign to do that. Now, call me crazy. I got an idea. I'm listening. So what else? We got a famous Enterprise, the aircraft carrier, right? The car rental company. Well, the aircraft carrier, <laughs> United States Navy, yep. USS Enterprise. Yep. How did they do that too? I'm thinking we get a letter campaign organized by podcasts from outer space. Yes. We get everyone to write in because we need an aircraft carrier named the Millennium Falcon. Yes. Hell yeah. (laughs) Hell yeah. Right, right? Hell yeah. Yes. We got to make that our goal, man. And a rocket ship. We just start writing. Let's just start writing like naval officers (laughs) and like Navy generals like Tom DeLong. Navy generals? I mean, Navy admirals. (laughs) (laughs) If Tom DeLong can write and meet with all these fucking... uh, uh, big wig generals and admirals. Why can't we? Allegedly. Well, he's got a lot more money than us, number one. Okay. I like where your head's at, though. So NASA, they say, hey, we got all these nerds writing us. They're going to fucking have a riot if we don't name it the Enterprise. A riot? A nerd riot? <laughs> a nerd riot. Pencil protectors everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so They name it the Enterprise, and the original cast was on hand for its presentation to the public on September 17th, 1976. Good year. So, in 73 to 74, the series was briefly revived as an animated version. Uh, Star Trek the Animated Series, we familiar? Pretty good. Now, Roddenberry uh, began developing a new series, Star Trek Phase 2, in 1975. Those plans were changed after the success of Star Wars 
and close encounters of the third kind. And the plan instead was expanded to become Star Trek, the motion picture. Now, initially this troubled the studio because of budgetary concerns, but Star Trek, the motion picture actually went on to become a box office hit. Uh, this had a budget of 46 million, took in 139 million, and it was directed by Robert Wise. This guy also did the original Day the Earth Stood Still, um, The Haunting, which is a great Halloween movie, uh, West Side Story, Boom. and Sound of Music. Now, adjusted Interesting for... Interesting combo. Yeah. yeah this guy's tackling musicals and then decides to go back to sci-fi. So, adjusted for inflation, Star Trek The Motion Picture was the third highest grossing Star Trek movie with the 2009 film coming in first and the 2013 film coming in second. Old J.J. Abrams. Yep. Old J.J., which we'll get to... We'll, we'll talk about him later. Got a whole spiel. Now, overall... The original series spawned six motion pictures between 79 and 91. And in 1980, Gene submitted a treatment for a proposed sequel. Paramount rejected Gene's proposal and essentially forced him out of the production. And I mean, that's Hollywood for you. They replaced Roddenberry on the project, but did name him executive consultant And he would retain this position for all the future Star Trek films. But under this arrangement, he was compensated with a producer's fee, percentage of net profits, in exchange for um, offering non-binding story notes and corresponding with the fan community. So they just kept this guy around. Like Apparently, he was such a pain in the ass because he was always changing scripts, um, last minute, you know, doing shit behind the other producers' backs that they forced him out of his own Hey, uh, Rod, here's some money. We're going to put you <laughs> yeah. on as producer for the rest of the series hey. and uh, just get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, we're going to put you on as producer. Um, you can give us notes, <laughs> uh, but we're not going to guarantee that we're going to change anything. And you can just interact with the fans. We're going to keep you on for the fans because – you know, before this, he was going around to all the sci-fi conventions, so the fans knew who he was. So uh, they talk about this later on on the uh, the Chaos on the Bridge documentary, like what you just said. Like both of that was true. Like you got these nerds who anything that says <laughs> Star Trek that doesn't have Gene Roddenberry. His name on it, they're just going to be like, it's not real Star so Trek. So it's not canon. Yeah, but you're okay. also like, again from that documentary, he. So he's doing all these things out there. He's going to all these conventions where people are telling him he's like the greatest mind of this yeah. generation. Yeah. And uh, he's basically just getting his ego blown up. Uh-huh. So he's he had blown he, up his ass. Yeah. He had problems with this on the original series, but when you get to like the next generation where he truly thinks, you know, he can do no wrong, he would take scripts and just completely rewrite yeah. them and add like, stuff in and, he Whatever really, he says goes. Yeah. And, uh, it's his world. <laughs> yeah. He really had some issues with like boundaries and everything. <laughs> and, and you really see that within the first season or two of the next generation where most people that like the show are going to be like, yeah, the first season or two. No, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just imagine him like rewriting someone's script, which was good. And then they're like, Gene. Just get the fuck out of here, Gene. You crashed four planes. What do you know about flying? I like to picture him as like Whitey from Eight Crazy Nights, just going around <laughs> like, oh, here's a script, and he's just like crossing stuff out just to fuck with people, like laughing about it the whole time. Probably. That's how I who, it. Who is that guy y'all did the episode? Um, y'all did an episode earlier. I can't remember what it was. Uh, a writer who would finish all his books like the night before they were due, or like bang them all out, like Philip hmm. K. Dick. That might have been know. it, yeah. I don't know if Dick did that. I know Jack Kerouac did that a lot. Well, we didn't, well, we didn't do one about him. Yeah. No, I know what he's talking about. They took the script like that day. It was for a show. You, I think you did a lot of the research was it Twilight on it. Zone? No. no, it wasn't Twilight Zone. <clears throat> Dude, you know what I'm talking about? Wasn't, didn't R.L. Stein just crank him out? Ooh, that might have been it. Could, yeah. Someone would just wait till the last minute. We had a whole thing about it because we were talking about how yeah. it under pressure. That okay. was kind of like that was kind of what Gene did. Okay. He would he would get a script the day before, and then he'd turn in a script like, "Yeah, I wrote this last night." <laughs> <laughs> and this was around the time where he was just doing loads of blow. 
I mean, we'll see later. This guy was on hella drugs like Stephen King, but I think it was around like this time where he started. Was it Stephen King? Is that who we're thinking of? No, he, that guy's very like calculated in his novels and playing them out. He writes for like hours a day. At the um, Red Sox games? It yeah. was, I, I think it was either Dick or, um, or R.L. Stein, maybe. Go back and listen to all of our episodes. Let us know. One of our listeners, let us know. And let us know which one was. But, um, <laughs> No, for real. Like, uh, I think once the motion picture was like a hit and Gene started getting that Hollywood money, he was just fucking railing coke and he's just do redoing scripts, like running around. No, what if we do this? What if we do that? Gene, you're <laughs> not like, in the Gene, LAPD anymore. You can't just do whatever you want. Gene, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so, you know, we got the success of the motion picture. Um, this leads to the creation of Star Trek The Next Generation, 87 to 94. This is the one that we loathed every Saturday morning <laughs> when Hal was watching it. And um, this was set many years after the original series with the USS Enterprise helmed by Captain John Luke Picard. Your blow up action. Your blow up action figure of <laughs> Patrick Stewart. That your mom got you. God only knows what you were doing with that. Put a fucking red wig on it and a pencil in the left hand. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, this generation of Star Trek tackled, it, tackled issues such as racism, gender, torture, and remains one of the most popular cited series to this day. Like we were saying earlier, this is the one I think of um, when I think of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. I see this series. Um, Roddenberry was involved in creating the television series The Next Generation, but his involvement was diminished greatly after the first season. Uh, He again, like we were saying, angered a lot of the workers. (sighs) He micromanaged the series, uh, rewriting scripts. They never like said to the fans, "Hey, we're kind of button Gene out because they like Bobby was saying like his name was valuable to fans. They were like, "If Roddenberry's attached, I'm fucking buying it." It's kind of like we're seeing with the new Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. you fucking hate anything that's not Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now let's get into the final frontier for old Gene. So in the late eighties. Roddenberry was afflicted by early manifestations of cerebral vascular disease and encephalopathy. Too many rails to the face. Now, what is that, Adam? You were an EMT. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, so this I'm was laughing at this guy's rails to the face. <laughs> this, yeah, this was a result of his long-standing recreational use of legal and illegal drugs, including alcohol, methaqualone. Methylphenidite, <laughs> a lot of meth, Dexamol. What the fuck? Is and, it sounds like processed sugar. And the big C, cocaine. He used cocaine regularly since the production of the motion picture. Um, hey, Kirk, get back here! I got a rail for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, throughout much of his career, got you uh, banging a black chick in this one. Come on, let's do it. Let's do a couple now, this is actually pretty funny because, like, he's such a fucking nerd. And yeah, he's just right, back right, there right, just right. fucking, just <laughs> railing. Like, he probably wrote a lot of the fucking scripts while fucking blasted on fucking coke. Gene had a uh, crazy personal life, too. I, I think Adam kind of touched on it, but he had uh, another girlfriend that he put on the Star Trek, the original series. Oh, while so he he's was like had, old Okay, yeah. let's, uh, let's pause right there. Hey, you want to be on this nerdy ass show and do some blow with me? Great date right there. I mean, that's Hollywood, that dude. Just yeah, cut that that's out. That's LA for you. <laughs> that's LA, dude. You tell a girl you're on TV, you don't need the to panties say nerdy, are dropping. Right. Yeah. Star Trek. Hey, you want to be on my TV gives, show and uh, dude, we'll snort get, cocaine off my dick? You've seen all the fuck. <laughs> 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 dude, you've seen all the fucking Trekkies that are famous. We'll get to that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we'll later. get to that later, but you should put that on your bumble actually. Wanna be on a TV show and <laughs> <came up>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. your matches will substantially increase. Yeah, see how many Especially matches if you expand you to like the LA region. <laughs> oh god. All right. So the effects of these substances were coupled with diabetes, high blood pressure, and antidepressant pers- prescriptions. Mm. So that can't be good. <laughs> Now, following a stroke 
In September of 1989, Roddenberry's health continued its descent, ultimately requiring him to use a wheelchair. Uh, his right arm was paralyzed after another stroke in early October of 91, causing ongoing pain and muscle atrophy. Uh, he also had problems with his sight in his right eye, and he found communicating in full sentences difficult. Too much masturbation will do that to you, okay? <laughs> You're unbelievable. On October 24th, during a visit to his doctor, Gene Roddenberry went gently into that good night. So we got to pour one out for old Gene, king of the Trekkies. Pour one out or sniff one up. Yep. Snort him if you got him. Drink him if you got him. (laughs) Snort him. We can say he's gone where (laughs) plenty of men have gone before. (laughs) Yes, yes, he has. So when Roddenberry died, Star Trek Deep Space Nine was already in development, but the idea was not fully formed. Uh, The series began filming less than a year after Roddenberry's death. So Deep Space Nine delved into galactic politics and the morality of warfare as it centered on a space station on a contested border with a wormhole across the galaxy. Contested border, welfare, this is our show. Build the wall, yep. We get this is our show. We got fucking border patrol like people, um, <laughs> galactic you know? border patrol. Yeah, we got. Yes, yeah, um, we know we space got space wall. Yeah, space force. Now, uh, other series in Star Trek include Voyager, about a starship tossed across the galaxy, making a seventy-year journey home. Star Trek Enterprise went retro, and this is. Uh, back to humanity taking its first steps into space about 100 years before the adventures of Kirk and the Enterprise. Focused on how the world of Kirk and Spock came to be, and more recently, Star Trek Discovery has aired online and focuses on ethical quandaries related to preemptive war, animal testing, and war crimes. Now, let's talk about the legacy. So in 85... Gene Roddenberry was the first television writer to receive a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. When the Sci-Fi Channel, now this is pre-Y, like spelled it S-Y-F-Y, this is when it was actually Sci-Fi, when it was launched in the U.S., 11 months after the death of Roddenberry, the first broadcast was dedicated to two science fiction pioneers, Isaac Asimov and Gene Roddenberry. Japanese astrophysicist Yoji Kondo proposed naming a crater on Mars after Roddenberry in 94. This was supported by Carl Sagan and Arthur C. Clarke and was agreed to by the International Astronomical Union. Now, can we all agree that, like, that's the ultimate sign that you... Like, getting on The Simpsons and having a crater on Mars named after you. That's yeah. how you know you've made it in life. Well, Simpsons, it's how you know you made it, but Crater on Mars is how you know you're a fucking intergalactic nerd. I mean, you've got <laughs> you Yeah, know? can you name me any other craters on Mars? If you can, you're probably a fucking Trekkie. You've got Carl Sagan. Yeah, and, uh, Carl Sagan, big Isaac nerd. Isaac Asimov, Arthur big C. Clarke. Yeah. yeah, all nerds. But do they have their own craters on Mars is what he's asking. I would assume. I was asking if anyone can name any of the craters on Mars. Well, Stephen Hawking crater, probably coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> Elon Musk crater. They got a Tesla up there, He's right? He's probably going to create a crater. Greatest football Slam player into of all it. time. Create a crater. Do you get to That's name great. it if you make it? Hey. Now, uh, recently, Patrick Stewart stated on social media that he would return to the role of Picard from Star Trek The Next Generation in a project with CBS All Access, which also airs Star Trek Discovery. Now, let's get into the parodies, tributes. Uh, You know, like you were saying, Simpsons, Black Mirror. You remember that episode? Sure don't. Saturday Night Live. (laughs) We got the Orville, which is, um, Mm. what's his name? Seth MacFarlane's new show. Um, Stargate SG-1, Stargate Atlantis, Galaxy Quest. Classic. Futurama, Family Guy, Beavis and Butthead, countless others. And as always, (laughs) got to discuss the XXX version. Hustler, 
put out one starring Sasha Gray Ooh. and Jada Fire. Uh, this ain't Star Trek XXX. Check that one out. I mean, there's countless um, Star Trek parodies. There's, but this one is actually pretty funny. So I was watching some of it <laughs> for research purposes. That's what I'm looking only. for in my pornos is comedy. And there's, <laughs> and there's also hey, if you're not laughing while you're having sex, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And there's also another good one is Deep Throat Nine, Star Trek <laughs> Deep Throat Nine. <laughs> <laughs> now, famous fans of Star Trek. There's a bunch. Uh, we just pulled a few notable ones that we think are noteworthy here. Daniel Craig. 007. Uh, Rosario Dawson. <clears throat> Clerks 2. Megan Fox. <whistles> Mila Kunis. <Come> on. <whistles> uh, Tom Hanks. <whistles> <laughs> ben Stiller. Robin Williams. Four went out for him. Roy Orbison. Mm. Frank Sinatra. And the king, Elvis Presley. Really? Yep. Trekkie for life. Eating jelly donuts and watching Star Trek. It's part of his daily routine. <laughs> <laughs> now... Our special guest here has pulled a list. Um, maybe you guys aren't familiar with Star Trek, you know? I mean, nope. maybe for our younger audience or our younger listeners out there, they might think of William Shatner as the Priceline guy, you know? <laughs> or the mask from Michael Myers. <laughs> so, I so you know, if you're, if you're just like getting into the uh, Star Trek, um, you know, you want to check out some episodes. You're just getting into the lore. Hey, where do I start? A little bit. Yeah, there's so much shit, you know? So from the original series, check out Arena, City on the Edge of Forever, which is actually my personal favorite. That one's a classic. And um, let this be your last battlefield. Um, if you want to check out The Next Generation... Maybe go with uh, Darmok, uh, Measure of a Man, Drumhead, and The Inner Light. Those are probably my favorites from that uh, series. And Deep Space Nine, check out In the Pale Moonlight, uh, Far Beyond the Stars. Just mentioning on the DS9 thing, In the Pale Moonlight probably comes up as you know ev- one of the best Star Trek episodes of any of the series, but it's probably the least, you know... Trekkie of all of them because it's basically my personal favorite the bad guys win oh, <laughs> type situation I, I mean talking like Avengers all those series love them because the bad guys win right. got like Voyager um, Living Witness is probably one of my favorites I'm a big history nerd so I kind of like playing around with that and they also have your you know classic evolution debate with uh, distant origins a lot of people didn't really like Star Trek Enterprise I was a pretty big fan they had some really good ones. I thought the best ones were Andorian is- in- the-, the Andorian Incident, uh, North Star, and the two-parter Demons and Terra Prime. They're probably going to be your best for like getting a feel for the series. Mm. Okay. Now, in, in regards to the films, so what would you say, I mean, what are some of your guys' favorite of the Star Trek films? I know for me, I would say the best one is honestly probably... The Wrath of Khan. That's my favorite one. That's what I think of when I when I uh, see a Star Trek film. I personally enjoy all the odd number of films. <laughs> <laughs> You're a monster. <laughs> <laughs> You're oh, evil. <laughs> now, obviously, Rob, he's a huge Chris Pine fan. Obviously. <laughs> uh, he loves the one with Chris Pine. Only one I've seen. Star Trek. It's obviously ahead of its time. Um, and it predicted a lot of future technology. Now, I pulled some of the things that it predicted, and if anybody has any other things that they notice, feel free to let me know. But the communicators they use, pretty much like modern cell phones. Okay. I wait, mean, keep in wait, mind, wait. this was back in the, uh, what, the fifth, uh, 60s. 60s. Yeah. Um, you know, like cell phones, uh, the earpieces that they wore on the communication bridge, Bluetooth devices, mm. guys. And anyone that's still using that is probably a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they have these like tricoder things that are essentially like these new, uh, they're called LOCAD PTS or L O C A D PTS. I don't know how you would say it. It's an acronym. You're not a nerd. For this, like, uh, it's this technology that NASA is like just starting to use now. It's a portable biological lab. 
So essentially they can take like a sample, put it in this little portable thing and it tells them like, hey, this is this, this, and this, you know, just like in Star Trek. Pretty crazy, actually. Yeah. And the use of interactive video screens, just like modern day conferencing, video conferencing, FaceTime, uh, Skype. And beaming people up. Oh. Oh, are they doing that are today? They do- <laughs> <laughs> hey, probably pretty soon. Hopefully. Now, for you guys, what's your favorite? Or, all right, obviously you guys are uh, Star Wars fans. Obviously. Obviously. Bobby? What would you say your favorite of the series is? Series? I don't know. That's a tough one. You Uh, just said Enterprise. Come on. Come on. Uh, Yeah, I like the last two seasons of Enterprise because they actually had, you know, good episodes. (laughs) 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 See, this guy admits that it's not even that good. And he's a Trekkie. (laughs) I mean, usually with these shows, the first season or two, they're kind of fine and they're like, you know, That's TV they're shows feeling it general. out. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, You know, then once you get down to like the season three, they're like, okay, we got our run. We know how people interact. Let's uh, play around with that. And you're canceled. Now, what's your, <laughs> now, what would you say your favorite captain is? Sidney Crosby. Please. We're talking Star Trek. Oh. Another terrible captain. Oh. I want to have to go with, uh, Maybe it's just because it was out when I was, uh, you know, really appreciating it. But I really liked um, Archer from Enterprise. Main reason, he's going, it's prequel, he's going out there, he's like new, he's all stoked and excited to get out there. Okay. And then all these guys are just like fucking their shit up. They're like, hey, you guys are like, go back to your little hole, you guys, and uh, just, you know, learning to adapt to that. And he's got that, you know, optimism, but he's also kind of... Uh, Seeing okay. how things really run out there in space and getting his uh, getting his ass handed to him a lot and getting his rocks off. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm gonna probably catch a lot of flack for this, but I said it again. I'll say it. Bef- uh, I said it before. I'll say it again. <laughs> the guy that was in the cage that um, Shatner got the position over, Pike. I think he's a far better captain. I like that guy the best. Mm. That I mean, guy is fucking badass. Oh. He's got a hell of a jawline. <laughs> he looks like a captain. All right. He's in the um he's in the what is it, the first JJ Abrams Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, he had like and a then, minor uh, role. I saw that. In the second season of Discovery that's gonna be coming out at some point. Um, I guess he's gonna be like the captain or the main character that's gonna be in there. Mm. Okay. Guys, let's just admit Spock's the coolest character. Not beat around the bush. Now, isn't there like something where like um and now correct me if I'm wrong, but it was there like an episode or something where it's like Spock does like Spock like doesn't have sex? Something or other. Oh, I think it's something with like the uh the Vulcans only Yeah. Which, which this that's the species he is <laughs> for all y'all um who aren't nerds. Um, <laughs> I guess they only do it like every ten years or something. Okay, so, so they're it's like, like um, it's a big deal when it happens. So they're like pandas. Oh, so it's no secret why he's wearing blue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's what I think of. That's all I got for Spock. But um, that's all you think. <laughs> yeah. Twenty years I, in abstinence. I, I remember that there was like a up Star Trek's fan base. No, there was some <laughs> big thing with like the morality. Some of big that. old blue balls. <laughs> Not all of us can have four girlfriends, you know? <laughs> um, hey, that's a problem, okay? Let me tell you a good Bumble bio. No, but I mean, uh, Bobby, he put some other things in here. I mean, maybe we'll get to these. Maybe we'll cut this. But um, <laughs> <laughs> let me just pose these questions to you guys. Okay. So, and we can go around. We can do round robin, popcorn, however you want to do it. Are we as optimistic about the future as Roddenberry? And if not, why? Begin with you, Rob. Oh, yeah. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, I feel like this guy, a little bit more creative than us, maybe. A lot more cocaine than us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot more money, a lot more cocaine, fueling his ideas. But so. you think we're going to be like flying in space, having adventures, or are we just going to kill ourselves in like 10 years? Mm, the way it's going right now, I would say probably going to kill ourselves. Because no one seems to give a fuck about the planet that we live on. And, you know, this guy has this idea of like, oh, everyone's going to bring peace to the galaxy and live in harmony. 
Well, sorry, Roddenberry. That's just not how it is. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Right, T-Bag, what do we got? Um, based on the kids that I work with, y'all ever seen Wally? Yep. Yeah. That's where we're headed. Oh, like floating around with iPads? Just fat as fuck. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you got a lot of fat kids in class? No, I'm just saying, like, all people do is, like... Throwing their trash everywhere. Yeah, spacing out zombies, sitting in chairs. Who's the smelly kid in class? It's me. <laughs> Okay, Bones, how about you? Dude, that's a tough one. I mean, you could do a whole episode on just mm. that question about, you know, are we going to make it or are we not? It's uh, Well, I feel like you're beating around the bush here. I want a black <laughs> and white. Yes or no. Yes or no. Maybe Bobby Bones Maybe has a, a black little and white one liner. <laughs> answer. Let him get to it. So, short term, part of me, there are times when I'm like, dude, we're definitely not going to make it. Uh, again, what Rob was talking about, environmental stuff. Um, Adam with like the Wally reference there are times where I'm just like dude we're just you know fucked yeah we're just <laughs> fucked um, I feel like though at the same time I'm like I gotta keep hope in that somebody has you know to. Ap- that like optimistic you know hand holding together future cause he's a trick. if it's gonna happen man you gotta have someone that believes in it and it's gonna make it work but at the same time you can be like well, the world's a shit place, but we can try to make it better. You know, it's you got to recognize how shitty it is in order to be like, yeah, we got to fix some stuff around here. That's Just like spiel. Leonardo DiCaprio over here. All right. Now, <laughs> <laughs> next question. So, well, we didn't hear your take on it, buddy. Uh, you know, I think we're going to be fine. You know, uh, let's not beat around the bush. Mass hysteria. Everybody's freaking out. Sure. Calm down. Be good to one another. We'll be fine. You know, I mean, we got to, yeah, we just got to start treating each other better. Golden rule. Mm -hmm. This guy's saying it just as good as Gene. Now, no secret, guys. Now that we've covered Star Wars, we've covered Star Trek, let's get to a controversial segment. Star Trek versus Star Wars. So let me read through these things. I got a couple spiels, and then we can kind of, you know, state our own opinions if we if we feel so inclined. So William Shatner, Kirk himself, argues that Star Trek is superior to Star Wars. He says that Star Trek had relationships and conflict among the relationships and stories that involved humanity and philosophical questions. Uh, Shatner believes that Star Wars was only better than Star Trek in terms of special effects. And once J.J. Abrams became involved, Star Trek was able to supersede Star Wars on every level. Now that's coming from Kirk, so a little biased. (laughs) Now is this pre-J.J. Abrams going over to Star Wars and quitting Star Trek? I'm not sure about that. Sounds like he's saying that once once J.J. Abrams got it, it was like blowing Star Wars away. Well, yeah. that's, you know, that's an inside job right there. Exactly. Abrams set up Star we'll Trek and that came conspiracy. over and fucked over Star Wars. <laughs> now, Tim Russ, who played Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager... Was he a rapper? ...claims that it is difficult to find common elements to be able to compare them. Just like Shatner, he says Star Trek reflects human issues, uh, morals, you know, ethical questions. Star Wars... And his view is classic medieval tale, um, dressed up as an action adventure, Please. embodies the Eastern philosophy of inner strength. And he says, despite both their successes and popularity, Star Trek comes out as better um, because it is set in our galaxy and people can relate to it better. <laughs> Whereas Star Wars takes place in another galaxy. Now again, also on Star Trek, so a little biased. I don't know if that's what actually happens in our galaxy. So it's better. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's the strongest argument <laughs> yeah. right there. I, mean. I can relate to um, getting beamed up and zipping around the galaxy with phaser guns and a captain's log. A lightsaber, that's just too far, man. <laughs> now, <laughs> and a guy commanding your ship that looks like he had sex with the Predator. Now, Jeremy Bullock, best known for his role as Boba Fett in the original Star Wars, huge Star Trek fan of the original series, but he says while both franchises are popular, Star Wars comes out as superior mm-hmm. for its soundtracks and special effects. Uh, okay. Now, in a New York Times article, they wrote that Trek fandom revolves around technology, 
because the Star Trek universe was founded on ham-fisted dialogue and gong show caliber acting. But the fictional science has always been brilliant. The science of Star Wars is nonsense, and everybody knows it. (laughs) But nobody cares because Star Wars isn't about science. It's an epic drama. It's about those incredibly well-developed characters and the moral decisions that they face. Uh, People don't get into debates about how the second Death Star works. They get into debates about the ethics of blowing it up. And all those poor stormtroopers on there. And all those contractors on there. (laughs) (laughs) Now, this guy, this billionaire guy, Peter Thiel, he says, and I quote, I'm a capitalist. Star Wars is the capitalist show. Star Trek is the communist one. Mm. He further stated there is no money in Star Trek because you just have the transporter machine that can make anything you need. The whole plot of Star Wars starts with Han Solo having this debt that he owes. And so the plot of Star Wars is driven by money. That's such a capitalist thing to be like, hey, no one wants or needs in this universe. That sucks. Whereas this one is like, hey, this guy has debt and is basically risking his life to survive. I mean, that's that's straight from a billionaire. So, of course, he's a a capitalist. Now, let's get into the creator. So, Star Wars creator George Lucas said, Mm -hmm. Star Trek softened up the entertainment arena so that Star Wars could come along and stand on its shoulders. Now, is that kind of a, um, what do you call it, like a backhanded compliment? <laughs> That's a tribute, I mean. Because he's saying like, hey, Star Trek softened people up, exposed them to sci-fi. Star Some Wars. call it a fluffer. Star Wars. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know a lot about that. Uh, Star Wars you came do, along. Mr. Hustler over here. Star Wars <laughs> comes along, blows it out of the water, Stands right on Gene's shoulders. Little brother. Yep. Now, Gene himself once said, I like Star Wars. It was young King Arthur growing up, slaying the evil emperor finally. There's nothing wrong with that kind of entertainment. Everything doesn't have to create a philosophy for you, for your whole life. You can also just have fun. Wow. No, that's a backhanded compliment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what are your guys' honest opinions? Because when I think of this, I'll get I'll say my whole spiel. Because okay. when I think of it, I think of it as comparing apples to oranges. You know? Star Trek, like we said, it was aimed at adults. It tackles moral issues, it tackles philosophy. It's the more sophisticated ones. Mm. Like we said, you know, you you hear that intro music, you're in a lobby on Prozac <laughs> and Star Wars. It's aimed at kids. We were all exposed to it as kids, so of course it's awesome to us, and then we grow up our whole lives with that. So when you compare the two, it's like, you know, it doesn't really hold. Also, Star Trek was a show. Star Wars started off as a movie. Mm. Um, There's a lot of shit with Star Trek. Star Wars, you can kind of be like, hey, these first three films, check them out. Boom. You know? Some might say you could check out the first six films. Some might. And maybe even uh, the uh, animated series. Yeah. So I think they both have their um, ups and downs, if you will. But they're completely different uh, realms of sci-fi, if you will. But I did find Star Wars franchise as a whole it's pulled in seven times the amount that Star Trek has. Weird. Hmm. Numbers don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, women lie, men lie, but numbers don't lie lie yeah just peep those stats i think you and uh that video we watched earlier really hit it on the head like if you want to get real deep like inception type philosophical shit you go with star trek if i'm watching something on the tv or in the theaters i'm not trying to get philosophical i want to see action i want to get entertained okay okay you know i also in the same boat would much rather see some lightsaber fights some blasters going off, see a Death Star get exploded, (laughs) and not see a bunch of nerds in rainbow clothes sitting around talking for two hours. Okay. (laughs) Any rebuttal from the Trekkie? No offense to my main man, Spock. (laughs) I mean, I thought those uh, quotes you had are actually pretty good. Um, So, I mean, apples and oranges, I'd say like Star Wars is more like the medieval, like, Beowulf or Sir Gawain mm. and the Green Knight. It's more like that. Hero's Journey. Yeah, it's got Johnny like that Campbell. allegorical. The morals are allegorical, yeah. so you can 
see some guy slay a dragon, but still, like, at the end of the day, you can be entertained and get that, like, very subtle message. I mean, Star Wars has philosophy, but it doesn't, like, bang you over the head with it as much as yeah, Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, You know, sometimes you want to see that stuff pretty much, like, laid out for you, and you want to see that drama of, you know, that philosophical discussion. Sometimes you want to see a guy slay a dragon and, uh, you know, blow up a Death Star. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, apples and oranges, like, Beowulf compared to, like, I robot. They're two yeah. different things, man. You know, so I think, you know, what the ultimate what we're getting at here is Star Trek more sophisticated. Yeah, oh, more, I have my pipe and I am studying <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> oh, and Bobby Bones and I have a liberal arts degree. This, this, you know, both are scarily accurate <laughs> representations yes. of me. <laughs> and Star Wars is kind of more let's see some fucking lasers. <laughs> it's a fucking sword fight but at the end of the day it's all fucking nerds that fight over this shit you know it's made famous by the 2009 film fanboys mm. um you know classic argument there trek versus wars it's one group of nerds versus the other camp of nerds this is bloods and cribs when it comes to nerds now i do have a little conspiracy rant before we have a monologue from Bobby Bones playing us out. So J.J. Abrams. <coughs> Sorry. This might go hand in hand. Director and producer, as we said, of Star Trek 2009, Star Trek Into Darkness 2013, and producer of Star Trek Beyond in 2016. Also directed and produced <clears throat> Star Wars The Force Awakens in 2015. And... <laughs> Did he he produced um, uh, the Last Jedi? Right. He had something to do with that. Shit so, show. what are we thinking there? Where do JJ's loyalties lie? Started off as Star Trek, came over to Star Wars. Now, Adam, you fucking hate the new Star Wars. Yes. So is this guy? Maybe you just hate JJ Abrams. He's embedding <laughs> himself into the Star Wars community to ruin it because he's a diehard Trekkie? Is that what we're thinking? No way. Now, in an interview, he said he wasn't a Star Trek fan until later in life, and he only took on the Star Trek films to get his foot in the door for Star Wars. He had to butter him up just like Star yeah. Trek did. He, he's a fluffer. Star yeah. Trek was his test run, his fluff run. And then... He said, hey, check this out. Now I need to do Star Wars. Then they pull him into Star Wars... But instead of making it better, according to D-Bag. Made it worse. Made it worse. Unbearable. Please, come on, dude. So what are we thinking? Is this a whole conspiracy? Or is this just an entertainment conspiracy to tie the universes together <laughs> to try to quell this fucking ongoing debate between Star Trek, Star Wars? Now we've got the same guy Crossover pulling all the strings. Soon. I feel like it's a band that uh, they put out a good album or two at first, and then... Um, you know, 10 years down the road, they go big, and everyone's like, dude, their stuff nowadays kind of sucks. You just need to check out the earlier stuff before <laughs> they got big. Well, see, that's what I wanted to get at. Okay. Trekkie, Mr. Bones, like, I hate new Star Wars. Is there, like, a device in it? Like, me and this guy go back and forth all the time. Is there a device in this, like, oh, new Star Trek sucks, you have to watch the old stuff, or do you just like the whole, I don't want to say genre, what am I looking for? Uh, the, like whole the whole series, series is like i mean all the originals through the, films. the whole franchise the whole franchise thank you yeah i mean you got people uh Old i think school, for the most school. part most people are going to be pretty cool with it you'll get some uh most of this honestly is just from like checking out like the reddit uh subreddits for like star trek or whatever but um because i've never been to any like conventions or anything not yet but, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Mostly it seems to be like, oh, I really like, you know, the next generation. Most people are really into the next generation because, I mean, that's what we grew up with. Right. That's what they remember seeing. And that was like one of the longer running ones, right? Yeah. And that's, I mean, I think there's only 60 episodes for the original series, so they yeah. couldn't really syndicate it. Now, is there any, like, arguments of, like, hey, this is not canon in Star Trek? Ooh, um, or like is just like you were saying earlier some of the stuff Roddenberry wasn't on they were like hey we're not counting that or um, I mean at times it's been a little wishy-washy um, as far as the canon situation goes honestly I, I mean as long as 
the long run story remains consistent, I don't care. I'm mm-hmm. not going to be like, well, they said it was like 23 gigahertz in that <laughs> one, and it and this one they said it was 24. So which was it, guys? So I mean, okay. Yeah, as but, long as long as the show is good and uh, it does its thing, you know, I can pretty much overlook it, and I think most people probably could. And J.J. Abrams, big conspiracy, because you don't like the J.J. Abrams Star Wars films <laughs> at all. But would you say you like the Star Trek films? I'm afraid to even watch them. Okay, maybe watch them. Maybe. Let me let us know what maybe. you think, and then that's like a flip flop because hey, you like what he did with Trek but you hate what he did with Star Wars. Maybe. Maybe that's because he blew his load. <laughs> like he blew his load too early, you know? <laughs> like he used all his good shit on Star on revamping Star Trek, so he was running out of shit by the time he got to do Star Wars. I do think if y'all are uh, Star Wars fans out there, the J.J. Uh, Abrams films are probably going to be your best bet to get introduced to the... Uh you know, the Star Trek canon you know, series. More, more action. Yeah, a little more less action. Less philosophy. It's, they're not really banging you overhead with that stuff. Kind uh, of fluff our way into the whole franchise. Yeah, they said the 2016 um, trailer was like a Mountain Dew commercial. One of the fans <laughs> said that. One of the critics or something said that. Because he was like... Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Trek. Because oh, okay. he was like, he's an ultimate Trekkie, so he's used to philosophy, all that shit, and then he saw this trailer and was like, a oh, fucking Mountain Dew commercial. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are like a few people who are like, you know, oh, J.J. Abrams, uh, don't watch that. I think <laughs> Not at this canon. sounds yeah, like Adam. <laughs> at this point, I think most people are just like, yo, we keep getting our shows canceled. We're just glad for any Star like Trek to be on television or anyone to be talking about it. So um, I don't know. It looks like it's starting to get back up. You got the Picard series, you got Discovery. So uh, we'll see. All right, now to wrap this one up. We got a personal monologue from our guest, Mr. Bobby Bones. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Star Trek, it shows us how we can become better than we are. The road ahead may be long, but a better world is possible. That world is one in which we can learn to take delight and appreciate each other's differences, and those differences make our society richer and more robust. The dark side of human nature may always be with us, but it is recognized and is struggled against every day. A world in which we work to fulfill our potential for the good of ourselves and for others, instead of for selfish and base motives. It's primarily an optimistic belief that no matter what we can achieve, we can always do and be better than we were before. Live long and prosper. And this is directly from his college application essay. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, on that one, we are out of here. Um, hey, man, really good to have you on. Um, thanks a lot for some of this research you mm-hmm. did. Uh, really helped us pull this one together. And stay safe out there, guys. And uh, other than that, be sure to uh, subscribe and five-star review on iTunes. Smash that like button. And as always, you know, feel free to shoot us any questions comments concerns over at the uh, podcast from outer space at gmail.com or slide into those dms on instagram podcast from outer space i just want to say thank you all for having me over here uh thanks to our listeners and uh looking forward to some more uh podcast bobby bones good as hell to see you buddy to our listeners out there so long and thanks for all the fish live long and prosper Sheets. That's where my idols always meet. I like to be there.